So we just talked about the basic counting rules, and now we're going to talk about permutations and combinations. And in the next video after this, we're just going to do some practice of all of it. So if you felt like that last video was a little bit short on practice, that was on purpose so I could put the practice in the practice video. So here let's talk about permutations and combinations. So let's start by looking at a permutation. A permutation is an ordered arrangement of distinct objects. So let's look at a couple of key words here. Ordered being that the order does make a difference and distinct saying that the elements in the set are not the same. So an R permutation is the arrangement of R elements of a set. So for instance, I have a very small set here, set S, that contains three elements A, B, C. If I were to find all of the two permutations, that would be a B would be an element of that set, and a C would be an element of that set, but a A would not because again, they're distinct objects. And then B A, B C, C A, and C B. So again, distinct being that they're different, and ordered makes a difference because otherwise AB and BA would really be the same thing. So obviously it's really easy for a small set like this, but what if I wanted to do it for a much larger set? Well, then we're going to start talking about how to use a formula. And first let's look at some of the notation P, N, comma, R. N represents the number of objects in the set. So here we would have P, three, and then R represents the number of objects that are chosen. So if it's a two permutation, I would choose two. Now I can sort of reason through this, but we are going to give it a formula, but I can sort of reason through it and say, well, there's three elements in the set. And so for the first position, I have three choices. And then for the second position, I have the two choices that remain. So three times two equals six, and if I didn't have to list them, then I would be done. But obviously, even then, it's nice to have a formula that we can just plug in the values and go. And so our formula says, because this is essentially saying that I'm going to take n times n minus one times n minus two, blah, 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 times n minus r plus one. And we can turn that into a formula because basically the second is one less than the first and so on and so on and so on until there are just n minus r minus one ways to, choo to choose the last element. And then remember that would be n minus r minus one, which is where we got the plus one because we distributed the negative. And essentially what we're saying is that we can write this n choose r as n factorial over n minus r factorial. So again, let's take a look at that using this formula. So three, three comma two would say I'm going to take three factorial divided by three minus one, three minus two factorial, which means that I have three times two times one over three minus two, which is one factorial. And that did give me the same answer. So let's look at a couple of practice. In how many ways can 100 marathon runners place in first, second, and third? So if I weren't using the formula, I would just say, well, there's 100 people who can be first place, and there's 99 people left who could be second place, and there are 98 people left who can be third place. And again, this one's not very difficult to figure out if I just get my calculator out. But instead, let's get into the habit of saying this is 100, choose three, and that tells me to take 100 factorial over, then I'm going to take 100 minus 3 factorial. Now, why does that help me or why does that give me the right answer? Because the numerator is 100 times 99 times 98 times 97 
dot, 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 all the way down to 1. The denominator, 100 minus 3 is 97, so this is 97 times 96, dot, 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 all the way down to 1. And so what ends up happening is all of the rest of these get canceled out, and I end up right here. So again, did that save me any time? Well, not on this question, not really, but on very large questions, questions with a lot of options or a lot of numbers, then it will save us some time. Plus, there's a handy dandy little button in your calculator that will do this for you. Let's look at the next one. How many bit strings of length eight end in zero, zero? So again, bit strings, this is going to be a permutation because the order does make a difference. So again, if I have eight, eight options here, but I'm saying these two end in zero, zero, then what am I going to do here? I'm going to look at the six that are left over. These two are set. This has two choices, two choices, two choices, two choices, two choices, two choices. So my answer here, I wouldn't really look at using the formula on this one. Instead, I would just say the probability, or sorry, the, um, the number of bit strings of length eight that end in zero, zero is two to the sixth because I've set this as zero and I've set this as zero. And so there's really only one option for those. So it's like I'm taking it times one, two times. So my solution would be two to the sixth. So now that we've looked at permutations, let's look at combinations. Combinations are similar to permutations, except that they are unordered. So the order does not matter. And again, everything else is really the same. We're talking about an R combination, which is a subset with R elements. So again, if I looked at my tiny little set, ABC, if I were going to find all of the two combinations, let's start by looking at the number of two permutations, which we already did. So we said AB and AC, and we also said BA and BC, and that's a new one, so I'm gonna write it in yellow. And then we said CA and we said CB. And so there are six two permutations, but how many two combinations are there? there's only three. And why are there only three? Because we had two of everything, so we had to end up dividing by two. So our formula helps us to do just that. So obviously the formula is important on this one. And so my formula says I can find the number of combinations, n comma r, which tells me in this case, I would be finding the number of combinations of three items and I'm choosing two and this tells me to then take n factorial divided by n minus r factorial just like I did before but now I'm also taking it divided by r factorial and that r factorial is what's going to end up getting rid of all of the duplicates so here I'm going to take three factorial and just like I did before, three minus two factorial, which is just one factorial, but also two factorial. So this ends up being three times two times one, three minus two is one factorial, so just one, and then two factorial is two times one, and notice what happens, I end up at three, because I ended up dividing by that two, essentially, that got me to the answer of three. So I got rid of all of the duplicates by dividing by two. Here are a couple of practice questions for us. How many poker hands of five cards can be dealt from a standard deck of 52 cards? So again, we ask ourselves, does the order matter? And in this case, no, it doesn't because five cards is five cards. So it doesn't matter if I get the king first or the king last, I'm just looking at a hand of five cards. So to sol solve this, I would be finding a combination of 52 items and I'm choosing five of them to be in my hand. And my formula says that I'm going to take 52 factorial divided by 52 minus five, which is 47 factorial divided by five factorial. 
So again, that ends up being 52 times 51 times 50 times 49 times 48 times 47 factorial over 47 factorial times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. So really, the whole point there is the 47 factorial goes away, and then this denominator that's left represents the number of duplicates we would have because we were not concerned about the order of the items. And so we end up with quite a large number actually, 2,598,960. Let's look at our second question. How many diagonals does a convex polygon with n sides have? Now keep in mind we're not always going to be just an easy question using n or c or uh, p. You're going to have to think about some of these. So here it says how many diagonals does a convex polygon with n sides have? So let's take a look at just a hexagon. So obviously a convex polygon with six sides. So if I'm looking at this vertex, how many sides, how many vertices can I connect that to? How many diagonals can this one make? Well, this would take one, two, three, right? So my first has three diagonals. My second has one, two, three diagonals, okay? My third has one, two, three diagonals, but guess what? I counted one twice, which doesn't make me happy, right? And then that continues. So obviously I have, if there are six sides, I had n minus three, and I had n minus three, and I had n minus 3, and I had n minus 3, and I had n minus 3, and I had n minus 3. So before we actually look at how I'm going to figure this out for n sides, let's take a look at why was it n minus 3? Well, this vertex is not going to be connected to itself, and it's not going to be connected to either of the sides that are already adjacent to it. So I have to take three sides away to determine how many diagonals can be made. So I'm going to take n minus 3. Now, how many times can I do that? Well, it's how many vertices do I have? I have n vertices, so I'm going to take n times n minus 3 is the number of diagonals there are. But remember, we have some diagonals that were counted twice, and so I'm going to have to divide by 2. Why 2? Because I counted it one time going this direction, and then I counted it one time going this direction, so each vertex got counted twice. So this is the formula that I would use to find the number of diagonals a convex polygon with n size has.